Yeah. Of course. Okay, so it's a big. Uh, so Peter, you have an Abel laureate in the audience. Ah, at yeah. least one, <laughs> and possibly some future ones. <laughs> <laughs> Very it's good. It's a great That's pleasure good. to have Peter Olver talk about his buddy Alan Tannenbaum. As usual, please uh, mute yourself unless you have something to say. Thank you. All right. So thank you very much, Doran, for this opportunity. This is both a great pleasure, but also very sad that we uh, uh, that we have lost Alan. Uh, let me see. Wait a minute. Where are we? Slideshow. What's going on here? Oh. Uh, Oh, wait a minute. So, um, is this on, is this full screen to everyone or it's not? Oh, I see. Here we go. Here's the yeah, full screen. Right. Okay. Is that the full screen? Now we see yeah. Wikipedia. Okay. This looks perfect. Yes. Okay. Okay. This is, this is the one. I don't know what that window was. Okay. So, so again, thank you. So I would like to talk about my good friend going back 50 years to 1973 uh, I'll, I'll give some details of the history and uh, talk about Alan's work, but I'm not going to be able to do justice to all of Alan's work. Alan contributed to so many things along the way. Um, and if you look at his Wikipedia article, you'll see you'll see a good collection of the work that he did. He's particularly known for his work in control theory. And then he came to Minnesota. We collaborated in computer vision and image processing. And that's what I want to concentrate on is, is some of his contributions there. He did a lot of work in uh, optimal control, uh, sorry, uh, optimal transport, Monj Kantorovich that I won't talk about. And then towards the end of his career, uh, he got very interested in cancer research and was, uh, was a fellow at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering working in cancer research. And it's uh, very ironic and very sad that he died of brain cancer. Um, a, almost a year, not quite a year after we had a, a memorable 70th birthday party for him uh, in New York. Alan was from New York and basically went in a complete circle and ended his career at Stony Brook and living in New York. And what two of the things, if you knew Alan, Two of the things that always stand out to you was a his sense of humor. He had this he had this remarkable sense of humor, and uh, uh, was jokes and comments and so on uh, constantly coming with his laugh. And the other thing that he always uh, liked to do was reminisce and tell stories about the past. And this included lots of stories about our times at Harvard, which I'll mention, uh, but also lots of stories about growing up in Rockaway in New York City. And one of the interesting things about this 70th birthday celebration that we had was we not only had colleagues uh, uh, and friends from academia, but we also had a lot of his friends from growing up from high school, junior high school, and even earlier. And people who we'd heard stories about from Alan over the years suddenly appeared in real life. And that, that was, it was very memorable. So I'm, uh, um, let me start off. This is this is Alan's Google Scholar page, uh, uh, page, and as you can see, the top citation one is his work in control theory, which I'm not going to discuss, uh, not being a not knowing much about control theory myself. But I'm very proud of the fact. I'm proud of the papers I wrote with Alan, and I'm proud that particularly two of them show up as the uh, third and fourth cited works. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about both of the, what's in both of these papers as we go along. And then there's other things, of course. There's many, many papers. If you look at his Vita, it has over 500 publications of one sort or another. So he was extremely active. He collaborated with all kinds of people and contributed to them. So let me start by showing you a couple of pictures. This is one of my favorite picture of Alan. This is when he took a memorable trip to Benin. Uh, and this is at the Voodoo Stake Temple uh, along the coast of Benin. I visited it as well. I have a similar picture, but unfortunately, I wasn't there at the same time as Alan. Uh, we did make one memorable journey together. In 2000, we were we joined in Sydney, and the fellow in the middle is Trifon Georgiou, who is now at uh, University of California in Irvine. 
also works in control. And we went up to the Great Barrier Reef and went diving on this memorable trip. And Alan loved to tell stories of the, the diving trip. I'm not going to go into full details as I only have a limited amount of time, but that's it's sort of, it's now 23 years ago. It's hard to believe time has passed so quickly. And I, I have to show you a picture of Alan with his family. This is an older picture. Uh, on, on the uh, left is Sarah, uh, their daughter, who now has three children of her own. Uh, she married uh, a mathematician, Zev Devere, uh, and lives in Princeton. That's Alan's wife, Rena, uh, well-known uh, chemist, chemical uh, uh uh, uh in, well known in chemistry and in her own right and then to alan's right is their son mani emmanuel tannenbaum who was just a brilliant uh student and then did a phd at heart he was a student of mine in when he was an undergraduate at the university of minnesota and then went on to do a phd in chemical physics at harvard just brilliant ended up working also in evolutionary biology and very tragically died also of cancer at age 33. And in fact, it was Mani's struggle and death that inspired Alan to also go into research in the field of cancer. Um, so this is where it all began for, for Alan and me. Uh, at Harvard, we both entered in uh, the PhD program in 1973. Um, and in fact, also, as I was talking about just before the talk began, my wife, Cherry Shakiban, also entered there at exactly the same time. And Alan, at that time, was a theoretical mathematician. I was some sort of weird applied mathematician at the time, because almost everybody was doing number theory and algebraic geometry. And Alan ended up being a student of Hironaka's, a famous fields medalist, uh, and also did a, his thesis in algebraic geometry. Um, we both finished in three years, um, and in fact, two days after I got my PhD, Cherry and I got married with the reception in the Harvard Math Department, um, but Alan had already left for Israel at that stage, so he unfortunately was not at the reception. So I left, lost track of Alan, this is of course well before social media and uh, email and so on. Uh, let's see. So, oh yeah, this was this was to show, this is Alan's uh, math genealogy page, his advisor, Haisuke Hironaka, uh, very, very, very famous in algebraic geometry. And uh, Alan, of course, had very, some outstanding students of his own, particularly Guillermo Shapiro, Tony Yezzi, and there's, there's others there um, that we have. So as I said, we lost track of each other in 1976. And then I ended up at Minnesota. And in 1986, Alan remarkably arrived in Minnesota and had reinvented himself as a control theorist and was actually hired in the electrical engineering department. So we had kind of switched roles. Alan became an engineer, so to speak, um, whereas I remained in the, the mathematics department. And of course, here's the control theory books that were referenced there. Um, this is a complete list of places that he visited uh, with the University of Minnesota, where we where we overlapped, highlighted. I'm still at Minnesota. Uh, sadly, through administrative stupidity, Alan ended up leaving Minnesota to go to Georgia Tech. And then finally, at the end of his career, and returned to his beloved New York at Stony Brook, which is where he spent the last 10 years of his career. And then you see his also appointment at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, and this is this is from the uh, website of the Department of Computer Science. This is a, a brief in memoriam, again, discussing all the various areas that Alan contributed to during his, his uh, spectacular career. OK, so as I said, I want to talk mainly about Alan's work in computer vision with a particular emphasis on what I know about the, the work that we collaborated together. So the way this happened is, as I said, Alan showed up at Minnesota in 1986, but we we talked from a, occasionally for a while. Uh, he was getting more and more interested in computer vision and image processing. And in 1992, I was actually away for a year at the University of Maryland, and he called me up and said, well, I'm getting more and more interested in 
symmetry and differential invariance in computer vision. And I think there's all kinds of applications and you know about this. I've been working quite a bit in Lie group theory, which is what I did my PhD in and uh, symmetry and differential invariance. And so he basically lured me into the subject, which was, which was, uh, I owe him an internal debt for, for doing this. We wrote quite a few papers together in those years. Um, and I want to describe some of the results we were we were working on. Uh, the thing that interested me was how much differential invariant theory had already made inroads into the computer vision community. So it wasn't I wasn't introducing anything new, but I was bringing some expertise in the area. So among the issues in computer vision that we worked on were multi-scale resolutions, denoising, smoothing of images, enhancement, edge detection, and segmentation. And then at the end, we wrote a, a paper, Doron already mentioned a paper with Kalabi in which we introduced a method of invariant signatures for object recognition. And I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit about all of these during the time. Um, and then we were particularly, and so Alan was, before he started working seriously in cancer itself, he was particularly interested in medical image processing applications. So we did some papers in, in that, and I'll show you some of the, uh, pictures and even maybe a video from that if we have time. So let me discuss a little bit about the mathematics that went behind this. So the idea was, and this was this was where Alan was working, was to use partial differential equations as a way of processing images. Of course, images are discrete objects. And so partial differential equations work on continuous objects, functions of several variables. And the kind of the motivation is, well, continuum mechanics or a motivation is the continuum mechanics is also partial differential equations, but it's still working on discrete objects, atoms and molecules. So you go to a continuum limit and treat everything as it's continuous. So of course, pixels are much more discrete than, than atoms and molecules, but still you get a lot of insight in the discrete world by by going to some sort of continuous limit and making use of all the technology that's been invented there. So in this equation, phi is representing your image, T is representing what's called a scale parameter. So it could be the degree of smoothing or it would be other things. So it's not, it's not really time, but it's what you do. There's this uh, scaling as time evolves, things happen to the image and you usually want good things to happen to the image. And then the right-hand side can depend on the positions and the values of, of the pixel at the pixels, but also gradients and higher derivatives. Okay. And the initial condition is your raw image. And eventually you get some sort of smoothed image or some processed image out of the smoothing. So that's the basic idea. Uh, so let's start by looking at uh, image smoothing or denoising. So getting rid of noise. So the simplest model of smoothing that you learn in any partial differential equations course is to use the heat equation, which is equivalent by the fundamental solution to Gaussian convolution. So you convolve the Gaussian with the initial image and that smooths it out. The problem with it is the Gaussian smooths out both the noise and all the features indiscriminately. So you lose the good stuff at the same time you're getting rid of the bad stuff. And so, a number of people, including Alan, had, at that time had the idea that we should go to, we should use nonlinear uh, smoothing rather than linear because we can do something isotropic. We can retain edges and other features while at the same time getting rid of noise. And uh, let's see. So here's an example of smoothing. This is Gaussian smoothing. So there's the original image. It's got some noise, but even though you smooth out the noise, you get rid of all the interesting parts of the image. Um, so introduced by Osher and Sethian was the idea of level set evolution, and this made a big role as well. So the idea was to look at the individual level sets of the image. So a level set is just where the value of the image is a constant. So these are, if you're a 2D image, these are just going to be curves in the plane. If you think of the image as being a mountain range, then these are the sets of, of constant altitude. And what we're going to do is we're going to evolve the level sets according to a flow that's in the direction of the normal. So the capital N is just the normal to the level set, proportional in some proportionality. 
And you can replace this geometric flow of the individual curves by a flow of the entire image. This is the level set evolution uh, uh, method that was introduced by Osher and Sethian, but it really caused a revolution in, in how you were, did image processing. Um, so you only smooth the level sets. Uh, they get kind of retained. They move independently of each other. You can continue. If you work on this version rather than the original geometric version, it's easy to continue after crossing and separating singularities. You can do 2D and 3D versions just as easily. I'm going to concentrate on 2D images from now, but uh, we'll, we'll see this. Now, if you're going to move a curve, so remember, we're always going to do a level set version of this, but let's go back to the curve flow. Suppose we have a parametrized family of curves, so they're moving smoothly from point to point. So you think of a curve evolving. We'll see examples in a second. Uh, in general, the time derivative is going to be, well, there's two directions. There's a normal direction and a tangential direction. Now, the normal direction is the one that we already saw here. In fact, we had a minus alpha at that time. The tangential direction is there, but it doesn't do anything. If you only flow in the direction of the tangent, you just reparameterize the curve, and the curve itself doesn't move. So we can take this tangential direction to always be zero, and hence the level set evolution is always, the curve evolution is always of this form. dc by dt is some multiple of the normal. And so the, the whole thing is, how do you des design alpha? How do you move it? And... The idea, so this is where, why Alan called me up is he said, well, there's some symmetry going on. And the idea is that humans are very good at seeing things. We, we recognize objects, we find our way around our environment, we can, we can compare things. And one of the things that's an essential attribute of human vision is that there are certain symmetries that come in. And I'll give you examples in a second. So the idea is because human vision has these symmetries built into it in some sense, let's build the symmetries into the image processing algorithm. So this is the basic idea behind why symmetry is important in such things as image processing. Of course, there's an interesting evolutionary question or psychological question, why are humans so attuned to symmetry? That's a good question. And the explanations I've seen, so if you look at art or all sorts of things, design and so on. We love symmetry for some reason. Uh, why is a good question. And I, I've yet to see a really good explanation of this. So in terms of mathematics, symmetry, mathematicians recognize going way back to Galois that symmetry is basically group theory. And so understanding the symmetries of an object is some understanding something about the group. Um, and I like this quote from a Russian mathematician, Alexandrov, who says, next to the concept of a function, the most important concept pervading the whole of mathematics. So function is the most important, but the second most important is group. So understanding group theory is very important. And it shows up not just in uh, abstract algebra courses, but all, in, all over mathematics and its applications. And my thesis, under Garrett Burkhoff at Harvard was actually in symmetry methods and group theory, going back to a Norwegian mathematician known as Sophus Lee. So let's look at some of the geometric transformation groups that show up in human vision. Uh, first, the most obvious one is translation. So you take an object, just that curve on the left-hand side, and you translate it. You can move it vertically, horizontally, or a combination of it. And that's the same curve. To us, it doesn't matter whether it's been translated. Um, so that's a that's an initial one. You can, of course, do rotations of the curve, rigid motion. So you can combine translations and rotations. Um, and let's skip that. Uh, and then, oh, oh, the re reason to to bring this in. So you, if you've never done this demonstration, rotations are non-abelian. In other words, they do not commute. So one of the things about group theory is it's not necessarily commutative. Um, one can do reflections. So then the question is, are the object and its reflection the same? And we would tend to say yes, or maybe we want to assign a chirality to them and so on. Of course, scaling or similarity, if you look at the object closer or farther away, you get into scaling similarity groups. 
So you gradually build up and then sort of towards the top of the hierarchy are the projective and what are called equiaffine transformations. So if you take a 2D object and you tilt it relative to your vision, you get another equivalent object. And now we, these are no longer equivalent under rigid motions or even scalings. There's a more general group known as the projective group that goes into play. And to, to demonstrate to you why we still as humans uh, have some sort of projective uh, symmetry built into our vision. Here's a simple example. Suppose I ask you what the shape of the rim of the coffee cup is. What is the shape of the edge? Well, if you don't think about it for much, you just say circular. Uh, but of course, on your retina, it's not a circle and it's, a it's an ellipse. So somehow our eye or brain is able to tell that if we tilt that, we get a circular rim. And uh, somehow it's able to recognize ellipses as circles, as tilted circles. So this is sort of maintaining why we should view much more general groups than one might ordinarily come to mind. And of course, uh, projective transformations made a, a big impact in art in the, in the Renaissance when they finally learned how to draw things properly in perspective. Um, okay, so let me let me summarize what we have. So there's the so-called Euclidean symmetry groups. Uh, this is because these form the foundation of Euclidean geometry. So translations, rotations, and possibly reflections. So those are length preserving. Uh, similarity is if you add in scaling. So when you do uh, uh, similarity geometry, in other words, where you look at the geometry of angles, this preserves the ratios of lengths, but doesn't preserve individual lengths. And then equiaffine, so the full affine is the groups of the form AX plus B. Equiaffine, the A that comes up has to have determinant one. So these are the ones that preserve area or, or in higher dimensions preserve volume. And the full projective group gets much more complicated than this. This is basically a, a SL3, if you, if you know the language for that. Um, and for various reasons, which I'll show you, the projective group is just too complicated for most mathematical applications. It's beautiful mathematics, but in terms of practice, it, it leaves something to be desired. And the equiaffine group turns out to be a very good approximation to the projective group. You can think, if you think of the projective group as tilting the object, then the equiaffine is if you don't tilt too far in some sense. Um, so, so what Alan, pose me the problem Oz. you have all these interesting groups that come up in human vision. How can we build these into the curve flows and ultimately the level set flows? So we take the symmetries and we look for curve flows that incorporate the symmetries. What do those look like? So we wrote a, a series of papers in which we completely classified what these were like. And let me give you the main examples. So if the curve flow, so I'm going to do Euclidean invariant to start with. The simplest one is what's called the grass fire flow. In mathematics, this is often referred to as Hamilton Jacobi. So this is the curves as if you have a, a fire in a field of grass and you look at the edge of the edge of the burning. Uh, you have this as the nonlinear different partial differential equation, and the one with phi is the corresponding level set version. And if you know about this, this is also the, the sort of flow that shows up in optics. You have the formation of caustics. When you, when you focus a lens, the, the, the wave fronts are, are going according to this and you, and you form caustics. Now, the next interesting Euclidean invariant one is what's called Euclidean curve shortening flow. Um, so this is if you move in the normal direction for the grass fire flow, it's just moving in the normal direction. Uh, uh, with unit length. For the curve shortening flow, you move in the normal direction, but it's proportional to the curvature. And we'll discuss curvature a bit more detail in a, in a little bit. But so this is the form. So these get a little bit more complicated. This is still a Euclidean invariant flow. This one shortens the Euclidean perimeter, in other words, the length of the curve as rapidly as possible. And 
There's a famous theorem due to Grayson, Gage, and Hamilton that if you start with a non-convex non curve, it eventually becomes convex, and then it shrinks to a point and becomes almost circular right before it shrinks when you obey this. This flow was introduced in the 80s by these as a precursor to what the very famous Ricci flow, which ended up uh, forming the, the, uh, the work of Perelman that uh, uh, solved the Poincaré conjecture uh, much later. But this was a sort of precursor to try to understand this more complicated Ricci flow. Now, one of the ones Alan really liked was the one that had the equiaffine uh, curve shortening. So in other words, you now have, this is invariant under the equiaffine group, not just the Euclidean group. So we're allowing tilting now. And it's instead of kappa, it's the cube root of kappa. And Alan loved to refer to this as kappa schlich, which uh, is Hebrew, is very similar to Doran's name of his computer. I guess this is one third and yours is three. So this was kappa schlich. Alan would always talk about this flow. This is it as a partial differential equation. And this is this is the corresponding level set flow. It's basically an analog of the grass fire flow, but the but for the equiaffine group, but it shortens the equiaffine arc length as rash, as rapidly as possible. Non-converged convex curves to shrink with points. And in a famous paper, uh, but, but kappa schlich means one third of kappa. And that's right. Cubic, yeah, exactly. The cubic root of kappa. So, so that's right. I know. So Alan, I don't know what the Hebrew for cube root is, but Alan just liked to call this kappa schlich. Yeah, so there's no cap. Okay. Yeah, because the one third was in the was in the exponent. <laughs> uh, so in a in a in a well cited paper that Alan wrote with Guillermo Shapiro and Sigurd Anjanant, uh, they they studied this in great detail, proving that convex curves shrink now to instead of round points elliptical points, meaning as they shrink to a point, the curve becomes more and more elliptical. Um, now, here's where the projective group starts to falter. So if you look for the simplest projectively invariant curve flow, it's this horrible rational function of fifth order derivatives of, of u. u again is the, is the, u equals f of x is the curve. This is the simplest possible one. It shortens the projective arc length as possible, but you have problems with curves become singularity. And as far as I know, the existence uniqueness questions for this uh, very complicated partial differential equation are still not known, let alone the numerics, how you would do this numerically to study it. Uh, so we tend to go to the equiaffine version, to kappa schlich, and not the full projective version. Um, so here's a, a, an example of smoothing out images using the affine invariant image flow, the equi-affine invariant image flow. Um, and then we wrote a paper where we basically did this for any Lie group whatsoever, but with a particular eye to the ones in uh, coming up in uh, computer vision. So this was published in a, a collection of papers in the mid nineties uh, that the Alan and I and Guillermo Shapiro, who was, just finishing as Alan's student at the time. He's now currently a professor at Duke University, very influential in this. Uh, the second thing I wanna talk about, I have to keep track of the time. Well, we've got a good amount of time, uh, is our work on edge detection and segmentation. This is the next question. So segmentation means finding the boundaries of objects in an image. Uh, so if you're given an image with an object image, where is the boundary of that object? If you want to process it, maybe you just want to work with the boundary. If you want to recognize it, you want to recognize the boundaries. So in the in the very early part, uh, part of the field, the edge is if I was the value of the image, then the gradient of I is supposed to be large near an edge because I is changing rapidly at edges. It's going from black to white or vice versa. And so, so the earlier detectors would look at where the gradient of I was large in absolute value, but that was not so good, especially in the presence of noise. So the noise would also cause large values of the gradient. So you need some smoothing, but as we saw earlier, smoothing will blur the image. So then you lose the edges. They're not so easy. So 
the method that was introduced by Cass, Witkin, and Terzopoulos, among others, and then developed by a lot of people, including Alan and myself, and Guillermo, and so on, and Tony, and so on, was to use what are called snakes, or act, also known as active constructors. And the idea is to use a geometric curve flow to capture the edge. So if you flow according to curve shortening, the flow is going to, the curve is eventually going to shrink down to a point. And the idea is to modify the curve flow so the snake or the curve is trapped by the features of interest instead of disappearing. So we'll see this. So the key observation, which I mentioned before, is the Euclidean curve shortening flow shortens the arc length of the curve, the length of the curve, as rapidly as possible. And so, uh, in other words, it's a gradient flow for this arc length functional. So that's that's the characterization. So the idea is if we just evolve according to this, the curve's going to disappear, but let's modify this arc length functional by putting in what's called a conformal factor and to stop, to enable to stop it. So the conformal factor is going to be small near features of interest and large where we want things to, where we, we're not interested. So because the edges are places where the, the curve has large gradient, one of the possible choices of sigma is one over one plus the gradient squared. So we don't want it to be singular. That's why we put the one plus. Okay. And then we analyzed this in one of those papers that was highly cited with Sacha Kitchen Asami, who was also at Minnesota at the time, and Aaron Kumar and Tony Yezi. We wrote a couple of papers, several papers on this. Um, and this is what the, the curve flow looks like. If you do the calculation, you take the gradient flow of this, you end up with this normal component, but you end up with this extra gradient component, whatever direction it's pointing in. And the level set formulation looks like this. And that's that's the version that 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 we used, and the analysis was based on the theory of viscosity solutions of PDEs. So let me, rather than go any further into the math, just show you some pictures. So this is an example of a snake on a medical image of a heart. So the idea is you want to capture that ventricle. So you see in in Figure C, that's what you want to capture. So you start by drawing by hand, say a curve that goes around the thing you're interested in, and you shrink it according to the curve flow, and that, that using the snake method, uh, enables you to capture the image, okay? So it works extremely well, even on fairly noisy images. I'll see, show some more examples, but then you, then you might say, well, this is a pain in the neck to draw a curve around the thing I'm interested in. Can I get away with something simpler? And then, if you go in the opposite direction, so instead of the curve shrinking to a point, the curve balloons out. So you basically change the sign. Uh, you, en you end up with what are called uh, inflating snakes or sometimes called balloons. And this works much better in the sense that you can just do a little curve at the, uh, in the center of the thing you're interested in. And the balloon, the, the inflating snake comes out and also captures the edge. And in the next one, we see that sometimes it's good to put in several starting curves and they'll eventually merge together. This is an advantage of the level set method that the curves will merge and you get, so even in this very noisy image of a cyst, you can, you can still capture the edge very well. And here's a one with a very complicated edge that's uh, more or less captured by the, by the inflating snake method. So this was the first, range of things that Alan and I and others worked on in the 90s. And then we got interested towards the end of our collaboration in this series of papers in the in the problem of object recognition. So let me spend the last uh, 15 minutes or so discussing that. And what I want to talk about is this paper we, we wrote with Kalabi and my wife, Cherry Shakiban, and a student of Alan and mine's named Steve Haker. Um, so the way this came about, this paper, was that uh, those of you who are, of, who are sufficiently old know that Minnesota used to have an institute called the Geometry Center that was funded by NSF. And the Geometry Center started life when my colleague Al Marden had the idea of connecting up very prominent geometers 
by what was basically a precursor of the internet. So the idea was to enable geometers to connect by computers and also collaborate in this way and also include in the center programmers who would help design software. So, and the geometry center was really successful. There are a lot of people remember it very well. The software was used particularly for 3D image processing in many, many uh, directions. But for some reason or other, which we can debate on why, uh, NSF decided that the Geometry Center was not fulfilling its mission. It was producing too many videos and pictures and not enough pure mathematics. So they had the idea of closing the center of Minnesota. And so Dick McGee, who's uh, still a colleague of mine here, Al is now retired, uh, but still around. So Dick McGee took over the center and one of the things he decided in an attempt to save the center was that it should get more into image processing. So he basically gave Alan and myself and Guillermo and uh, Tony was there at the time and so on, basically free range to, to uh, build up the center, build up its credentials based on image processing. And so Alan and I organized a conference and one of the people we invited to the conference was Gene Kalabi, the famous geometer, and we convinced him to collaborate on, on this paper and a couple of other papers in uh, affine geometry at the time. So that's how this paper ended up being written. And, um, so let me let me talk about this and uh, give you the pictures. Um, so I wanna talk about, so the, the signature curve as I'm going to call it is the curve parametrized by kappa and d kappa by ds. So I want to explain what kappa and d kappa by ds are in more detail, and then explain why this is why this is interesting. Okay, so let's go back to curvature. I already mentioned curvature earlier in the talk, but let's now investigate what curvature really means. So we learn we in mathematics departments we teach about curvature in uh, calculus often, or we should teach about it in calculus often. It's basically a measure of the bendiness of the curve. So the larger the kappa is, the larger the curvature the more bendy the curve is. When the curve is flat, the curvature is very close to zero. The curvature has a sign attached to it as well. It tells you whether you're bending in or out. So negative curvature is bending in, positive curvature is bending out. And the official mathematical definition of curvature is it's the reciprocal of the radius of the so-called osculating circle. This is the circle that best approximates the curve at the point. So you draw in that circle, and you compute one over its radius, and that's kappa, that's curvature. And this picture I like, because I always graph this picture wrong, and I think most mathematicians continue to graph it wrong. When we graph a picture of the osculating circle, we usually put the curve on one side of the circle. But in fact, generically, an osculating circle, the curve goes from the inside to the outside of the circle. Um, uh, so it's non-generically where it stays on one side. Anyway, that's the definition of curvature. So I'm going to test the audience. What everyday device that you use, almost all of you will probably use today, in which measures curvature. So there's some uh, things that are not red herrings. There's the red herring to go with it. These are not the devices for measuring. So if you think about it for a second, uh, I'm not going to ask anybody unless anybody wants to volunteer, but I'll give you the answer. Um, so here's a hint about the answer. So you see the car and the, the solution to the problem, how do you measure curvature is the steering wheel of a car. So as I said, most of you have maybe driven today, maybe not all of you, but a lot of you. So when you turn the wheel, the amount of turning is basically measuring the curvature of the road. So that's how we can measure curvature. And so now let's suppose we're driving around a racetrack. That's the curve up there. And we measure curvature as a function of time. And the question is, can you reconstruct the racetrack? Suppose you only know this, how you turn the wheel. You didn't pay attention to the road. Can you reconstruct the road from the curvature? Well, the answer to that is obviously no, because you can drive at different speeds. So the time is not the right variable to look at. So the right variable is the odometer. In other words, the distance you travel along the curve. Okay. And it turns out there's a very classical theorem 
that says, yes, you can reconstruct the racetrack if you know curvature is a function of arc length. In other words, the amount of turning of the wheel as a function of the distance. Okay, so now if you can reconstruct it, you can, of course, only reconstruct it up to Euclidean motion, uh, uh, translations and rotations. You get the same graphs. The one difference is if you start at a different point on the curve, the graph gets translated. So these are the same graph, but there's still an ambiguity in the where you started to drive on the racetrack. So although you can reconstruct it, you you have to compare these things. So the paper with Kalabi that we that Alan and I wrote uh, said the one way to get rid of this ambiguity is to go and look instead of kappa as a function of s, look at d kappa by d s as a function of kappa. So d kappa by ds is the rate of change of curvature. So if you think of it driving again, it's the rate at which you're rotating the wheel as you're going along. And that's the, th the theorem that I stated at the beginning says that under some regularity conditions, you can uniquely reconstruct the racetrack up to Euclidean motion by knowing this, this graph of uh, kappa versus d kappa by ds. And I had initially written about this in an earlier book, but uh, because of the influence of Alan and the computer vision people, I changed the name and I started to call these signatures. Um, so there's the original curve. There's the invariant signature. And of course, any curve that's a translation or a rotation of that one will give you a similar invariant signature. So uh, there is, there's a, let me briefly show the movie. So here's the car driving around the world. And then you see the signature. So when you get to the very bendy bits, it goes a bit off the graph, but and then sometimes it slows down. So that's a sort of illustration of that. And so this is a theorem that's in our paper. Uh, and uh, then we, but this theorem is actually a consequence of a very general theorem due to the famous geometer Ailey Carton as far back as 1908. So the kappa and d kappa by ds are examples of what are known as differential invariants. These are invariant functions of derivatives that are invariant under the group transformation. And Carton said that shapes, meaning smooth submanifolds, are related, in other words, equivalent to each other, if and only if they have the same relationship among the differential invariants. So this signature curve is a special case of Carton's very general theorem. Um, now, as I said, the classical signature is kappa is a function of s. Um, and has the problem with the ambiguity of where you start on it, whereas the differential signature, there's no ambiguity. Everything is purely local. It's even better if you have occlusions or you're only looking a part of the curve, then the classical signature comes in different little pieces and you don't even know how the pieces are, are glued together over the occlusion, whereas the differential invariant signature, you just lose the part that's been occluded. So you can still make very good comparisons. Uh, the advantage of having this carton uh, machinery behind you is you can construct signatures for other things. So space curves, you need torsion and curvature and the derivative of curvature. Interestingly, you don't need the derivative of torsion. For Euclidean surfaces, you need the Gauss and the mean curvature, although a more recent paper of mine, I showed that you only actually need the mean curvature. So this is a very general technology. Now, in computing them, um, we need to compute of course, everything is numerical when you're dealing with actual images. So there's a question of how do you compute curvature? How do you compute d kappa by ds? And I'm not going to go into the details. This is also in the paper we wrote with Kalabi. We advocated using invariant numerical approximations. And the very simplest of these goes back to the ancient Greeks. Uh, remember, curvature was one over the radius of the oscillating circle. So if you take three nearby points on the curve, you can approximate the oscillating circle. And if you use what's called Heron's formula, which they used to teach in high school or junior high school, I don't know if they still do, there's this very nice formula in terms of the lengths of the sides of the triangle and the semi-perimeter that gives you the radius and hence the curvature as an approximation. So it's this formula and then generalizations for d kappa by ds, particularly the one due to my student, Mireille Boutin, that, uh, that we made use of. So let me, oh, one last thing, and then I'll show you some pictures of signatures and then I'll finish the talk. Um, so one of the other things you can detect with the signature is symmetries. In particular, if you have a curve with a threefold symmetry, 
then every symmetrical triple of points goes to the same point on the signature. So basically you can detect the number of symmetries by the number of times you go around the signature. So in this case, you would go around the signature three times and that would tell you the number of symmetries of the curve. So there's an intimate relation between signature and symmetry. So here's some examples from that paper. There's an original curve, it's almost circular. The Euclidean signature is very close to a point. If it were an exact circle, kappa would be constant and kappa s would be zero and it would be a, the signature would degenerate to a single point. And on the right-hand side is the numerical approximation using those schemes. Uh, here's another curve that has an almost threefold symmetry. The Euclidean signature, we see that, that you have a, basically a winding number of three. It's almost three times on top of each other. And then you can do this not just for the Euclidean group. You can also do it for the equiaffine group. You could even do it for the projective group, although, again, the computations are just too difficult. For the equiaffine group, there's an equiaffine notion of curvature and an equiaffine notion of arc length. And so you get this. And then if I tilt that curve, the sig Euclidean signature changes dramatically, but the equiaffine signature does not change at all. So this gives you a way of recognizing it. And then coming back to medical imaging, this is, this is something that, that we also put in the paper. Alan really loved this image of the heart and we did all kinds of things with it. So we segmented it to get the boundary of the left ventricle. And then we computed its signature which is down below the first one. And then we smoothed it using curve shortening flow. And the interesting thing was how the signature evolved according to that. And we know how it evolves and why it retains a lot of its structure. Even when this is very smooth, you can still see a lot of the structure of the original signature. Um, very quickly in the last uh, couple of minutes, we then sent Steve Haker out to collect some objects so we could do object recognition. So these are what he bought at, his lo at the local hardware store. And then here's the signature of these nuts. The fourfold symmetry, rotational symmetry is coming because they're basically four times on top of each other. And here's two that are very different and of course have very different signatures. Again, we're recognizing them up to Euclidean transformations. Uh, and then later, my uh, Cherry, my wife, had a large number of undergraduate uh, research projects. This one, they were comparing leaves and getting pretty good results for recognizing different types of tree leaves using their signatures. Here's another project she did on uh, diagnosing breast tumors. Uh, so the signatures of benign versus malignant are very different. There's a benign one, and that's what its signature looks like. And the malignant one, because you have much higher variation of curvature, you get the signatures looking looking much more complicated, much more. And finally, do I still have a book? I'm supposed to finish now, I think, according to Doron, but I'm going to press I have my one time uh, in tribute to Alan. Yeah. So I'm going to press my luck and say one more minute. In more recent work, I've become involved with anthropologists. This became out of work of jigsaw puzzles. So there's a whole collection of work that we did on solving jigsaw puzzles using signatures that I don't have time to go to. This is an example with an undergraduate of mine where we solved this baffler nonagon using just the shapes of the puzzle pieces, not the pictures on them. In fact, this one doesn't even have pictures on it. So we did that. We did broken eggshells with ostrich eggs and other things. And then very recently, I've become quite involved in uh, work with anthropologists here at the University of Minnesota, including Katrina Yezi Woodley, who's the sister of Tony Yezi, who was one of Alan's students who I mentioned earlier in the talk. And we've been doing work on putting, putting these together in an attempt to understand human evolution. But because I've run out of time, uh, there's some putting bones back together. This is a, one, of, one of our students, Riley O'Neill, did this one on putting bones back together. But I think in view of the, of the dictum of uh, Doron that I should finish it on time, I will end it there and answer questions. Thank you. Thanks so much for fascinating talk. My only regret that Alan could not watch it. So yeah. we have plenty of time for questions. I have a quick question. So, uh, so why? So while, the, so while the questions are going on, if I can, I'm going to, how do I start this? Oh, sorry. How do I start? 
Oh, here we go. Okay, while the questions are going on, I'm gonna play this video, which I don't think we've ever shown. This is a video Alan and I put together at the Geometry Center, and it will show some of the things, but you have to wait a little bit. It takes a while. Okay, go ahead and ask questions. Uh, yeah, uh, Alan was famous in control theory. How did he move to, was it a completely independent or was it a natural transition? I think it, one, one I think it was a sort of a natural transition, but I, I actually don't know the full story behind how he ended up. I think the initial thing was, was they were doing control and they realized to control things like robots and so on, you needed to understand these problems coming up from image processing. Uh, and uh, so, and that kind of took on a life of its own. So he was starting to make the transition when he show, when he turned up in uh, Minnesota. I don't think he's, oh, there we go. Whoops. Ah, are there other questions for Peter? I'll go at the movie. Yeah, the movie. Uh, let me let me see. Just a second. I'm trying to play the movie. What? Problem is the the bar from Zoom is in the way of my playing the movie. Ah, here we go. There. So I'll start the movie around here. But anyway, go ahead and ask while I'm messing around with this. Well, may, may I may I say something? Um, um, I I don't I don't have a particular question, but I just want to say to Peter that this was a fascinating talk, and it was um, finally I understood a few things that I did not understand before. So thank you, Peter. All right, thank you, Rena. Thank you for for watching. I don't know what's happened to our movie. Let me put a plug. If you go to YouTube and search for. Alan Tannenbaum's. He has quite a few mm -hmm. talks that are fascinating. It's a strong recommend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is just seems to have. Uh... Can you include the URL for the? Uh, I don't we... know. I don't think we have the movie. I'm gonna. I have another option. I'm gonna try sharing sharing the other version of the movie if I can find it. Here it is. Let's try this. So this will be a bit smaller, but hopefully we'll play. This is in quick time. Okay. And it it's for some reason it took a while. So we we here we go. And really it should have always had the Mission Impossible theme music to it. So this is Alan's sense of humor. This video will self-destruct it. <laughs> Okay, so you, you'll you'll see things like contours expanding and so on, and then signatures going. So we this was when we were given free range of the geometry center and could do whatever we want. So we employed the programmers there to help us make this movie. And there's the, there's the evolution of the signature. Other questions? How do you compute it? Is it you solve nonlinear differential equations numerically? Yeah, so they're numerical computations for the non for for the smoothing. That's numerical not uh, differential solutions of differential equations. For the signature, we then we took the smooth curve and we at each step we recomputed the signature. So here you can see the signature disappearing to a single circular point. And then, and then there's some further numerics of that. So it's a numerical iterative algorithm. That's right, yes. Ah, interesting, beautiful. Wow. Yeah, no, I wish, well, we all wish Alan could be here. We didn't realize that at his 70th birthday how quickly things would change. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. It's great animation. Anyway, this notion of signature is really fascinating. Yeah, and here we did the affine version. So there's an affine signature we also computed. It's not clear what it's telling us. And as I said, 
since then it's been used quite a lot. So, so this movie was made in the 1990s? In... About 1996. Oh, there it is. Copyright 1996. Yeah. And Stuart Levy was the one who did the technical. The yeah. So do you have software that nowadays people can play with it and animate? Uh, I've, I've sort of lost track of what's available in the software. That would be nice. Be beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have some old software that I, I used to use, but the stuff that Steve Haker and uh, Stuart Levy were doing to generate the movie, I don't know where that is anymore. Yeah. I mean, you were pioneers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, Peter, this is Tony. Um, hey, Tony. Not for the signatures, but for all of the other stuff that you showed in the movie, I... I... I still have all that software available um, for anybody that would be interested in playing with it. Oh yeah, yeah. I should have. I should have, of course, mentioned. Yeah, Tony has been very good at maintaining and updating all the software. Yeah, in fact, it's all up to date. Uh, uh, so yeah, anybody that's interested, I, I'd be happy to share that. That's nice. Yeah, it's beautiful. More questions for Peter? Well, thanks, Peter, for a fascinating talk. Uh, I'm sure Alan would have been very, very uh, pleased with this beautiful talk. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for coming. Robert, peace and this meeting. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Thank thanks you. again, Peter. Thank you. And thank you, th thank you Doron, for organizing this. This is sure, a pleasure. I learned so much. It was really great. Thank you.